A year ago I recorded a couple videos about the shameless Russo Gambit, when in this opening position all of a sudden you play the move pawn to f5, violating all the classical opening rules and yet winning the majority of the games, which leaves your opponent feeling completely stupid. Now, since that time, those few couple videos became really popular, was watched by a couple million people, and the Eager Nation is terrorizing innocent chess players. If you're one of those chess gangsters, you gotta feel guilty. At least, I think so, because, you know, the end justifies the means is a bad rule to follow. With that being said, I understand you. Alright, anyway, let's get into today's stuff. So, some people question, they dare to question. The Russo Gambit. They say it's unsound, and if one only knows the right way to handle it, they're gonna defeat you easily. Now let's prove them wrong. The good thing about the Russo Gambit is that it comes out of the most popular opening moves, Bishop to c4. And your opponent is hoping to play the Italian game or something like that, but you shock them by playing pawn to f5. Now, if you play the Vienna Gambit with white, then you may notice that it's actually the Vienna Gambit with the reversed color. At first, it may seem like white's development advantage should give him some hopes for an attack, but somehow, strangely enough, it often backfires and becomes rather a liability than an asset. For example, most common move of white, because they gotta deal with this attack to their pawn, most common move pawn takes f5 actually backfires because you can push the pawn forward, chase away one of the knights, and he doesn't have that many good squares to go to, and if it goes back to g1, you can go forward with d5 and now take advantage of this exposed bishop, and so white's pieces, which were supposed to be developed and being an asset, you actually use them to attack them and to gain temples for your own development. That's why I said that the Russo Gambit overall is so tricky, you can fool your opponent badly. Nevertheless, let's assume that your opponent is aware of this variation, or that he's smart enough not to take on f5, but to play other moves that are more challenging for black. Now, computers suggest that there are two moves here by white, which are either pawn to d3 or even pawn to d4, where white seeks their counterplay right away, which are really challenging for black, so let's see what you can do there. If they play pawn d3, just defending this pawn on e4, there are a couple good things for you to do. You can develop bishop c5, it's a good option, but knight f6 is also actually not that bad. Now, with knight f6, you develop a knight, you put more pressure to this pawn on e4, and as we know, whenever they take on e5, actually it usually allows you to push d5 with the tempo and open your bishop and regain a pawn in the future, so it's usually not an option for white. And knight g5 may seem like a way for white to punish you for weakening all these squares, as now they target this f zone square, looks like you're in trouble. But in fact, this position is quite similar to the Freiliver attack, where your opponent is not on f5 on f7, but fundamentally doesn't change that much in the position, and you can play in a similar style. You can sack the pawn on d5 to shut down this diagonal, and after white recaptures, you do not recapture, after that your position is just a little bit too fragile with all these weaknesses, so instead what you want to do is to play knight a5, again, similar to the classical line in the two knights game where your opponent is not on f5 but f7, but having a pawn f5 has certain advantages anyway. And from a5 you want to take away this bishop on c4, which is the main attacking piece of white, and if you succeed in doing so, your position is gonna be good. They usually go bishop b5, winning a tempo with this check, then you play c6, and after an exchange of pawns, white is happy that they maintain their extra pawn, but you have like more space, more open lines, these pawns are also quite aggressive, they're ready to move forward whenever you need them to, so you have some compensation and it's still tricky for white to play properly. For example, when you go h6, kicking this knight away, you know, it can't go forward because you control this square, so it has to go back. Now you play bishop d6, developing a bishop and protecting this pawn. Let's say both sides castle. And at first it seems like white successfully castled, his king is safe and he can enjoy his extra pawn. But just think about this for a second. Which move would you play here if you were playing white? It's really tricky, because all the normal looking moves such as knight to c3, or rook e1, or pawn to c3, or many other moves are actually bad mistakes which lose straight away. I mean, so finding right moves for white here is very tricky. For example, the most common move rook e1 is actually a big blunder. Now, the issue with all these moves is that they ignore and don't stop your main threat of pawn e4. You chase away this knight, and after the knight goes away somewhere, for example d4, you then win with the typical tactics, great gift sacrifice, bishop takes h2. That calls the king out, and after that you follow up with knight g4, check to the king, and as it goes back, then you jump out with your queen to h4, and you threaten queen h2 check, supported by your knight. The f2 square is also weak, you can capture it as well with your either queen or rook, and you can just see that white is defenseless. Just to show one line, 
And you don't have to remember, it's pretty easy to see that black can either play queen h2 or queen f2 on the next move, and it's gonna end uh, in a quick checkmate. Just to show you one possible line, bishop e3, queen h2, king f1. And white is hoping to, you know, run away somewhere there. You can win in different ways, but one of them is bishop a6. So you shut down that route, and as he covers that, I mean, you can win in a number of beautiful ways. Queen h1 is checkmate in one. Knight e3, if you want to be, you can accumulate your opponent completely, you can do that, because it's pinned all over, and he can't recapture, whether you attack the king and the queen. So you can win however you like. Computer states that the most aggressive way for white and the best way for white is counter-striking in the center of the board with the move pawn to d4. It's a counterintuitive move and most of your pawns will be unable to find it because normally they'll think about their own pawn on e4 and they'll try to either take on f5 or defend it one way or the other. So that's what they'll do in most cases. But if your opponent is prepared, he may actually play d4 because that's the move suggested by the computer. What do you do in this case? Again, there are a couple interesting ways for black. One of them, which I like the most, is pawn takes d4. Now, the trick here is that this position is actually very complicated, and again, it's very counterintuitive for white here to find the right moves. Like, the best move for white is not to take here, and is not to take here. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But the most challenging move for black here is actually pawn to e5. Again, Hard to spot it for white, hard to understand why is it better than the alternatives. But white's idea is that with this pawn on e5, it does not allow your knight to go there. And also, it's not that easy for you to play d5 and to win a tempo attacking their bishop. Even though it's still what I recommend you to do, go pawn d5. And sometimes, you bet, some of your opponents are unaware of the en passant capture, so they won't play it because they just don't know that this opportunity exists. Uh, a lot of players reported these kind of moves as a bug on chess.com but it's not as called an passant capture. So if your opponent moves the bishop away, then it's cool because you gain a tempo for your development. You can just continue with bishop b4 check, you know, develop bishop to e6 and your position is just great. Now, of course, the best option for white here is actually to take advantage of this capture and to do it. Now, after that, you play queen takes d6, white castles, king side, and although currently you hold on to this extra pawn on d4, it is indeed true that your king is vulnerable can't easily castle king side because of white's bishop, and objectively speaking, black's position is dangerous. But still, it's very tricky and still very hard for white to find the right way. You play knight of six, just developing a piece. Now they go rook e1, checking your king, cover it with bishop e7. Now, although your position is a little bit exposed and this bishop is still active, your main plan is simply to castle queen side. I mean, you can't go there because of the bishop, so you want to go in the opposite direction. And what you want to do is to play bishop d7 and to castle queenside. If you can do this successfully within the following two moves, you're good to go, you have nothing to worry about, your position is great. Therefore, white needs to rush with their attack and find proper ways of doing that. And the most obvious way for white is trying to make use of those weaknesses and to go knight g5. It looks very advantageous for white, you know, aiming for the epsilon square, maybe even e6 square, where he can jump forward with the knight and this rook is active, like, it looks very advantageous for white, but knight g5 turns out to be a bad error. Strangely enough, you don't defend, actually, you counterattack, and it's not all that sudden, because the whole nature of the Russo Gambit is a very counterattacking opening. So we all knight g4, we do unto them what they did unto you. <laughs> so you also go knight g4, hitting this h2 pawn twice, therefore queen takes h2 is a major threat, and white has no time for his own attack, he's gotta address it somehow. Now, what can he do to stop you from moving forward and capturing this pawn? Well, he's gotta block the diagonal somehow, either by g3 or by moving the f pawn forward. If they go pawn f4, again, looks good at first, terrible mistake in reality, and you win by going pawn to d3. Now, the Russo Gambit is so evil opening that I really feel sorry for your opponents. Quite often their moves, which are good moves, normal moves, played by sound players, are bad errors that lose within a couple of moves. I mean, that's a crazy thing. I have no logical explanation of this. It's just a badass opening that you can use if you want to humiliate your opponents. So, pawn d3 gives way to your queen to jump onto this diagonal and to finish off your attack. And after white plays, Whatever move, basically, does it really matter? You just bring your queen to one of these two squares in order to check your opponent's king. For example, queen d4, check to the king. And what can white do now? The king has to move. Now, your knight controls this square, therefore he can't cover with a rook or a bishop. The king has to move. If it goes to f1, that's a checkmate in one. 
so that's the wrong direction. But king h1 fails to knight f2. This is a fork to the king and the queen, but you don't even need to capture the queen. You've got something more powerful, knight h3. It's a common smother checkmate tactical motif, useful to know. It works beautifully in this position just as well. Going back a couple moves, white still needs to somehow cover their h2 square. We know that f4 turns out to weaken this diagonal and it's deadly for white. What if instead he goes pawn to g3? That also leads to very spectacular variations. Once again, you just counterattack. The disadvantage of the move g3 is that it weakens this diagonal, as well as the f3 square potentially. And you just double down on that, and you try very hard to break through and to get to those weaknesses of white. So you start that by going knight to e5, which is a multi-purpose move. It hits the bishop over here. It also keeps an eye on this square f3, so that if you've got a chance, and you can support this invasion, you can do that later on. And finally, this knight covers the epsilon square, therefore your opponent cannot jump there and attack you. So it's a really well-placed knight, which does everything that you can ask for. Now, going back with the bishop would be just passive, so usually they try bishop f4, trying to pin your knight. And in this critical position, there is a very cool way for you to just transition into a powerful counterattack. Like first you take on g5. They, this eliminates this active knight so that it can no longer jump into your territory and cause any troubles. And secondly, the bishop is now distracted from this position where it pins your knight. So bishop takes g5. And now it's a very dynamic position where both sides has some ideas for their attack. Like your opponent is hoping to capitalize on this pin somehow, but the drawback of his position is that his king is weak, and all these squares is something you'd love to target. And computer here suggests a spectacular move pawn to b5, which I love a lot. It comes with a couple ideas. You want to win a tempo, because you hit the bishop, but primarily you want to bring your bishop to b7 and to attack all these weaknesses. And as soon as you put your bishop there, it becomes deadly for white, because then you have a lot of checkmate and threats. And so b5 allows you to do it without wasting time, because white is also trying to attack, so you've got to be quick. And after b5, if he captures it, you just move your king to f7, and although your king is exposed, like, there is no real way for white to attack it, and on the next move again, you're just going to play bishop b7, you know, and capitalize on these weaknesses. So after white plays something, doesn't matter what, let's say h3 or any other move, I mean, you can even ignore it completely and just go bishop b7. You know, your attack is so strong. Now with this bishop, you threaten knight f3 always, which is going to be checked to the king, attack of the bishop, attack of the rook. If he captures, like, besides knight to f3, the other thing that you've got is queen to d5, simply aiming for queen g2 or queen h1 checkmate. And knight f3 is still something that you've got. Plus, you know, this bishop on b5 is hanging, but mainly, of course, queen g2 checkmate. So that's how you win. Again, hyper dynamic variation and really cool. All right, so as soon as you play pawn to f5, hitting their pawn on e4 as well as their self-confidence, most players will take there, which is bad for them because it gives way to your pawn and you transition into this counter-attack followed by pawn to d5. Now, instead, the most challenging move for black is pawn to d4, where white tries to be active just as well. They want to attack you, they want to open lines for their pieces. Here we know that we can take over there. And we have just covered the move pawn to e5, which is the most challenging, and indeed, objectively speaking, it's the best move for white, but as we saw, you've got a lot of interesting attacking opportunities there. What else can your opponent play here? Well, he can either capture on f5 or capture with his knight on d4. These both moves seem to be very natural, seem like best options, but in fact they aren't. Again, it's counterintuitive, but e5 is the best one. Anyway, let's see if he takes over here on f5. What are you going to do there? Well, the usual drawback of white moving his pawn away from e4 is that it allows you to play d5 with a tempo, hitting his bishop, opening up a diagonal for your own bishop, and so you win temples for your development, and white has to waste time by moving this bishop around. If he goes bishop b5, you could go ahead and take back this pawn on f5, but it's even stronger to toss in this in-between move queen e7. With the Russo Gambit, we try to be as evil as possible and we never let your opponent do what he wants. So Queen E7 checks the king and, like, it's somehow uncomfortable for white to defend it, although he has a few options. Like, if he moves the king here, then he loses the right of castle and his rook also got stuck in the corner of the board. If he moves one of his pieces, like Queen E2 or Bishop E2, then he has to worsen his position to some extent, which is nice for you. For example, if he moves the bishop back, it's no longer active, you can now take back the pawn on f5 in a comfortable situation, then possibly castle queenside, and life's good.
All right, with covered pawn to e5, pawn to xf5, how about knight takes d4, another natural move for white to play. Then you play knight to f6. And it's super tricky once again. Looks like white can't capture this pawn on f5. But we know that the bad boy Russo Gambit has a lot of traps and tricks. And if he actually goes ahead and captures this pawn, which looks like just a good, completely sound option for white to pick a pawn, which is weak, undefended, you then strike back with pawn to d5. And it turns out that things aren't that simple for white. You attack the bishop, you attack the pawn, and if the pawn goes away, you also attack the knight on f5. All of a sudden, it becomes really shaky for white. Anyway, after a pawn takes d5, he hopes to counterattack your knight. But then you capture his knight, he captures yours, and although white remains to be with uh, two extra pawns, actually, after a queen takes d1, you force his king to move and to stay in the middle of the board. After that, you follow up with casting queenside, which in this case it turns out to be an attacking move. You also attack his king with a tempo. Cool. Now he's got a cover somehow, bishop d2. And the problem here is that although it's an endgame, you can still attack his king. It's centralized, it's vulnerable, and you can do that, let's say, by going knight to g4 this time, threatening this pawn from there, you're gonna fork the king and the rook. He can trade on b7 with check, but it doesn't change anything, you just recapture, and white is left with the same problem, how to address this threat. And after he defends the pawn one way or the other, let's say king e2, something like this, you continue with bishop c5, just bringing more pieces into play, still reinforcing the threat of knight takes f2, plus your rook is ready to join on e8 and attack the king. You can easily see how dangerous it is for white to play this position, although it's an endgame, where usually their king is safe. For example, if he tries f3, you don't have to move the knight back, you can go rook e8, gaining one more tempo for your attack, and you just win the game. He keeps dancing around with his king, while the rest of his army is completely passive and it's easy for you to win. You can go forward with knight to e3, attacking the king, attacking this pawn on c2, attacking the bishop, attacking everything. If he captures, you could recapture, but even stronger is to invade with rook to d1, checking the king and attacking everything in his position. And if the king goes forward, you can then capture the rook, plus notice that this bishop is pinned, therefore you're likely to capture it on the next move anyway. And your rook on h1 is actually pinning this knight, therefore it can't move. And again, you're gonna play rook takes c3 on the next move, so that's completely winning for black. We covered most of the ways that your opponent can try to challenge you when you use the Russo Gambit against them. And of course, you'll probably forget many of these lines and also your opponent can play something else. So what I'd mainly recommend you to do is to learn the right couple principles that allow you to find proper attacking moves on your own. Because actually there are just a few main attacking rules which allow you to do that. And if you're curious, I've got this free master clause that covers it, how to think properly to find attacking moves on your own, you can check it out. Also. Don't comment on this video, don't let anyone know that you shamelessly used the Russo Gamma to crush them, and just keep crushing them.